Hey friends, I'm going to tell some more Waylon Jennings stories today. All of this comes right out of this book. This is Waylon's autobiography. It was published in 1996. Like I said in the last episode, this is not a how-to book. This is a cautionary tale at best. It's not a manual of how you want to go through life or you know have your career. It's very entertaining, and I highly recommend you pick up a copy, especially if you're a Waylon fan. There's a lot of crazy stories of Waylon behaving badly. And if there's one common thread that runs through this book, there's a few threads, but one of them is just Waylon taking a lot of pills and everybody around him taking a lot of pills. And just how you realize how normal that was in Nashville at the time. And uh, he talked about pills as being medicine. He didn't think about it as, you know, getting high or whatever. He thought it was medicine where you're trying to stay awake because, you know, you've been on this crazy schedule and there's no time to sleep, so you would just take these pills. And it was later in life when he realized just how horrible and destructive and terrible and addictive these pills were and cost a high price for him and a lot of a lot of people, the ultimate price for some people. But I started off with him with Roger Miller, and I'll read a little bit about his thoughts on Roger Miller for you guys. Almost everybody in Nashville took pills. When Roger Miller and I got to be close, it seemed like washing down a handful of pills was a natural part of life. He was the cleverest and craziest man I ever met. He never quit being funny. No matter how wasted he was, Roger always looked fresh. He might have been up for a week, but you'd never know it. Where some of us would stay in the same clothes for days, he carried a portable iron and always rinsed his shirt in the sink and pressed his pants. Roger Miller had briefcases full of pills, and we had as many names for them as they had colors. Roger took these things called Simcoes, so we called him Roger Simcoe. They were what was known as an over and under. One side was a tranquilizer and the other would be an amphetamine, and they'd even throw in a vitamin with them. There were Johnny White Crosses, Wayland's Phoenix Flashes, some band names for you guys there if you need them. L.A. turnarounds were the best. We like to say that you could take one and drive to Los Angeles, turn around, and come straight back. <laughs> Pills were the artificial energy on which Nashville ran around the clock and then some. They were the drug of choice, and for a while, it seemed like 80% of the people in that town were comparing notes on who was taking which ones and what they were doing to them. Pill talk. I love the idea of all of these country music stars, you know, going in front of the camera with one hand over a Bible and the other waving a flag. And meanwhile, they're just pilled to the gills, at least 80% of them. And when I look at those old clips, I wonder who the 20% were that weren't doing it. Whenever I meet somebody who was around like back in the day and was on the road in the 50s or 60s and even part of the 70s, I love asking them, what was traveling like? What was it like to be on the road? How did you get from point A to point B in the vehicles you were in? And there were no smartphones, no GPS, no big hotel chains that you could find and rely on. And just imagine what the Chitlin circuit was like, you know, or the honky tonk circuit that Waylon was on or like a bluegrass circuit, just what that might have been like. But, but Waylon talks about that in this book quite a bit, and it's really interesting to me. If I can read a little bit, this is Waylon talking. The farther I traveled, the farther in the hole I went. I was having to get advances from RCA to get me transportation. I needed to have something to drive to shows. I was wearing out cars on a monthly basis. It was a form of control to keep us in debt and in their debt. Most of the time, we didn't mind. We were all excited, wide-eyed, and bushy-tailed to be going everywhere. But if we stopped to notice, it was always the same places, the same people, and for the same money. The band traveled in an old Dodge motorhome. It wasn't a bus. It had belonged to Red Sovine and had been sitting in his backyard. Every hose and tire was ready to give up the ghost. One time, going across the Rockies in Canada, Calgary to Vancouver, the brakes went out. And I'll never forget that night in Red Deer, 
sleet and ice and snow and us under the damn motorhome is trying to unfuse a push button transmission, get it in drive so we could keep going forward. But we were still in show business. We ha it talks about having a horse trailer that he had put the all the gear in and pull it behind this motorhome, and they would hit a bump, and every bit of gear they had would just go flying every which way in the horse trailer. So he'd show up to the gig and have to check the back of his amp and see if his speaker was still mounted in it. It's a really rough way to to go. He says the sound in the clubs was terrible because there was no PA systems. He never even thought about a monitor. The difference between having good sound and bad sound was whether you could hear anything bouncing off the back wall. Waylon talks about the first time he got to play the Opry, how he was playing with Bobby Bear, and they walk out on stage, and he's standing on those wood floors, you know, the same wood floors that Hank Williams stood on, Ernest Tubb stood on, all these greats that he admired so much. And just sitting back thinking, how in the hell did I ever manage to do this? What am I doing here? It was a nice moment. He said that it, he was later asked to become a member of the Opry. And he wanted to do it. But part of the problem was, if you're a member of the Opry, you're required to play a certain amount of shows a year. I believe it was 20 shows a year. And it was always on Saturday night. But Saturday night is the night that you make the most money on the road. So you would be giving up a lot of money. They offered him $90 to appear on the Opry back, back in the 60s. And that was, you know, not very much money. In other parts of the book, he'll talk about making, you know, like at least $400 on a date on the road. So you'd be missing out on a lot of money by taking that Opry gig. And 90 was union scale at the time. So he said no. He also talks about Johnny Cash uh, getting to play the Opry. At least I said no peaceably. John Cash had come to the Opry when he got his first record in the top 10 country charts in Billboard. He sat out in the Opry's manager's office for three hours, dressed in his black shirt, pants, sideburns, and rockabilly shoes until they finally relented and let him on the show. He encored seven times and only had four songs out on the market. He sang Hey Porter, Cry, 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 So Doggone Lonesome, and Folsom Prison Blues over and over. Everyone there appeared to love him at the Opry. He was so proud he had torn the Opry up. He joined the Opry but couldn't make most of the Saturdays because he'd be out of work on tours with Jerry Lee Lewis, Carl Perkins, Roy Orbison. So John would do one Saturday and miss three. Finally, they called him in and said that if he was intended to be a member of the Grand Ole Opry, he'd have to start showing up more. Ultimatums are not the best way to get on John's good side. So he said, well, this will be my last night. <laughs> at the end of his final song, he drug the microphone stand across the lights at the edge of the stage, breaking every one of them, one by one. I was just having fun, he told me, watching them pop. The manager of the Opry was less than pleased. He says, you don't have to come back anymore, John. And Johnny Cash says, I don't plan to. But when he got out into the car with June, he started crying, thinking someday they'll want me to come back. Waylon talks about being out on the road, you know, 300 days a year, playing one-nighters and just honky-tonks, you know, probably not the most glamorous gigs and crazy drives, the routing, I don't know who was doing the routing, but you know, all over America and throughout Canada, there's one particular uh, night that he talked about where he had to drive from Minneapolis to Atlanta, gigs on consecutive nights, so he just drove overnight, he did a bunch of pills and stayed up. That's 13 hours, I believe, by modern highways, and we're talking about in the late 60s. I don't know that uh, the interstate system was the same. I'm not sure I-65 would have taken you down there. But anyway, um, I'm going to read one last part to let you know about how sometimes the bad luck caught up with you. On February 9th, 1969, the band was heading to Peoria, Illinois, riding in a pickup that had a sleeper stacked on top of it. You could rest in the back, and one person could fit crosswise over the top of the truck cab in a specially made bunk. I had ordered a Bluebird bus from down in Georgia 
but it hadn't been delivered yet. It was to be my first new bus. Richie was in the front and had to let Jimmy Gray start driving. Outside of Bloomington along I-150 on the way to Peoria, they came to an old steel bridge over Kickapoo Creek. It was icy and snowy, and they had to make a sharp right turn. As they slipped on the black ice, the truck shimmied over and leaned a little bit to the side. Walter Chuck Conway, a bass player who had joined me just 11 days before, was asleep in the back compartment over the truck cab. The poor guy never knew what hit him. The pickup made the turn untouched and kept going, but the bridge clipped the sleeper, shattering it and shearing off the alcove. Chuck fell plumb in the river. Richie ran and jumped in after him, but he was too late. They said there wasn't a bone in his head that wasn't broken, and he died at the scene. Stu Allen Punsky, a keyboard player, was also badly hurt. I was traveling behind them in a Cadillac an hour or two after. When I came on the scene, it scared me to death. The police found pot in the pickup, but when I went down to the hospital, those cops showed me the bag of marijuana and said, Waylon, you got enough problems. We're going to throw this away. So a terrible, horrible incident that leads into one paragraph about Merle Haggard that some of you guys had mentioned in the comments. This is a one paragraph out of an entire book. Merle's name is mentioned two other times and nothing is said about him at all. But um, this one paragraph says a lot. I'm not completely sure what to make of it, so I'll just simply read it to you and let you guys decide. It scared me, made me feel responsible, even though there was nothing I could have done, we played the date using Hank Snow's bass player, and I was just wobbling around on pills and drunk. Merle Haggard and his manager, Fuzzy Owens, got me in a poker game and cleaned me out. I had four or five thousand dollars on me, and they won everything. They were there to get my money. That was it. I think Merle is a great singer and songwriter, and probably he was in a bad shape as I was, but we're, we've never been close since that night. I can still remember their faces. When I was broke, they said their goodbyes and left, and I never forgot that. That's in 1969. I don't know what to make of that. I have to believe there was maybe some backstory to that, and um, I don't know. If you guys know something that I don't, it's a sad thing to hear. I've also played poker quite a few times, never for those stakes, but I know that you don't sit down with money without being willing to lose it. But uh, I would like to think that friends might entertain themselves in a different way. I don't know what to make of that. I would like to, you know, Merle Haggard wrote his biography, you know, later after that. I haven't read it. But hopefully he addressed that maybe in that book. I don't know, man. There's a lot of darkness <laughs> in Wayland's story, and that's a pretty dark moment right there. But um, I hope you guys get something from this. And I hope that all of this talk of pills and stuff is not glorifying it because I don't feel that way at all. That's not how I look at it. I have no use for any of that crap in my life. And um but it's interesting to hear these stories. And it's also interesting to think of this as medicine, you know, just like people who once thought cigarettes were healthy. You know, that's an interesting way to think about it. I don't know what I think about that, but tell me what you think about it. And tell me what your favorite Waylon song is. We'll talk about something happier. Talk about the music. That's the important part of Waylon's, Waylon's legacy, the artistry. You know, that's the thing you want to emulate, the artistry, the man who stood up for for a record to sound the way he thought it should sound and not what, you know, the industry wanted it to be. The rest of this stuff is just crazy stories. <laughs> All right. I hope uh, you guys are taking care of each other and much love to each other. Or much love to you. Here's to better days.